Okay, class. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, it's coming in to focus. Okay, I'm trying to see. Should I keep it in the chair or should I keep it? Mm, maybe I should bring it back up. Maybe I should bring it up. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> okay, I guess this is gonna have to do. Okay. All right, class. So that I guess this just gonna have to do because the other books was a little was sitting a little too low. Whose books are up? Oh, those are mine. Yeah. Baby, it's been a long day. <laughs> it's been a long day. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about uh coding rules. And let me move this out. Well, you know what? Let me switch this out. Hold on just a minute. Yeah, I got these right here. I'm going to use Julietas. Okay, so. All right, hopefully y'all can see this better in behind me. Okay, good. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, a list of things, of objects to put on the board that we need to discuss today. Uh, being that we are still in hurricane season, well, uh, Ms. Harper going to try to condense this as best as she can so she can roll up out of here and go home. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> coding rules for ICD-10. Uh, and then we need to also talk about uh, what ICD-9 was about. We need to talk about that. Because at some point, you are going to encounter ICD-9, which is uh, still usable, which is still usable, uh, but as a cross-reference, okay? But as a cross-reference, and I'll explain to you what, what I mean by that, okay? Because some doctor's offices, some insurance companies that, sh that you may encounter or work for uh, may still use, I'm getting high flashes, so sorry, that's not the jacket, uh, may still use um, ICD-9. So, okay, so uh, ICD-9, ICD-10, it was implemented in 2014, okay? Implemented in 2014. Uh, so let me give an example of what those codes look like. Remember I said the other day that it's going to start with an alphabet, like A, an alphabet, and then a number, and then a, a point here, and then maybe a fourth digit, fifth digit, sixth digit, and then you have a placeholder, with an alphabet, okay? Okay, and that alphabet could be A, B, C, and so on, okay? Uh, ICD-9 was uh, three numbers, okay? A fourth digit, a fifth digit, uh, sometimes a sixth digit number, okay? Didn't have any uh, alphabets to highly specify, okay? Uh, and so the rules of how you will look up a diagnosis code in ICD-10 is the same way you will use in ICD-9. That has not changed, okay? So I'm going to kind of write it up in here where you have a uh, volume one, okay, volume, uh, 
uh, volume two. Then volume one. Okay. Now sometimes your uh, ICD nine books no longer ICD ten. This is ICD nine only. ICD nine only. Okay. Volume three. Okay. That's only for inpatient. Um, inpatient uh, coding purposes only. So you really don't need volume three. These volume one and volume two is what you need, okay? In ICD-9 and ICD-10. So I had to put that out there because uh, sometimes you have some physician offices uh, who are kind of still stubborn on using uh, ICD-9 and they should be well along their way using ICD-10 or having the software to use ICD-10. So some uh, practices or some facilities don't trans uh, transcend very well. So the reason why I'm bringing that to your attention, because I don't want you walking out blindsided to the fact that, oh my God, ICD-9, what should I do? The same principles I'm going to teach you how to use the ICD-10, you use those very exact same principles. It's just a little bit different. With the ICD-10, the alphabet that's placed in front beginning only gives a uh, greater specific to anatomic regions. Okay. You want to sit in the front? Yeah. You can't see the board? Okay, come on, sweetie. You ever had your eyes checked? No, it just started like I said, I'm like, I'm not Oh, okay. Oh, oh, honey, that is so critical. You need to have your eyes checked for real. Oh, you need to have that taken care of real fast. If you go to uh, University of Houston Central Campus, they have a school of optometry and uh, they will check it for you for a nominal, nominal fee yeah. because, you know, yeah. you, you could be a study patient for them. I really don't know what happened. Well, you need to start watching your blood sugar. I really don't feel bad. Yeah, but um, not really. Not really. But uh, um, I just noticed that it started getting like blurry, blurry. Like if some, like if I rub it, it started blurring. I'm like, oh, nice. Okay. Okay. But I had never had that problem before. I had like 20, 20 vision. Yeah. Babies tend to change it. Your body goes through a lot. Yeah. I've never had kids, but just working in the field for a long time and working for OBGYN doctors, yeah, your hormones, your body and your hormones go out of whack. Yeah. So when it's trying to come back together, and especially if you've been a gestational diabetic patient, were you gestational diabetes? Well, I had, uh, I had, I had high blood pressure, and I was mm -hmm. anemic, and uh, what's that? Anything? The thing where, with the high blood pressure? Uh, uh, preeclampsia, did pre you have preeclampsia? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And then I, they said I developed diabetes, but that it should go away when that happens. It does, but when you get in your late forties, your early fifties, you you kind of need to watch that yeah. uh, because it can redevelop. Yeah, like my feet still get swollen in my, in my yeah. calves and everything. Yeah, you need a, Did you have a C-section or did you have an have, They made me have a normal. One. They took me. They put me in labor for four days and and um, put me like these things, but I wasn't supposed to have a normal. I have yeah, I was, I was scheduled for a C section, but at Memorial, they made me have her like normal. They tried like four different inducers, yes. and I was in labor for like four days. Oh my god, yeah, Ooh. Four days. Right? yeah like I, I, I came on, on Thanksgiving, and my daughter was born on the 29th. Like, and, it's, and I was like, <laughs> I was at least pushing for like 12 hours. Oh, how much did she weigh? Seven, seven point six. Wow, okay. oh, 6 .7. you must have had a slow dilation too. Yeah, yeah, she didn't want to come back. And I was like, I was like, why didn't they give me other C section yet? You know, and like, we're like, here we try to do everything the most natural. They mm -hmm. said, after this, if it didn't work, if they didn't want to get it, they just messed me all up. Oh my god, but thank god she's here. Yeah, thank god she's here. Amen. So she's okay. How old is she? She's about four. It's just that I, I just was Oh, you! How old is your son? He's gonna be one in like twelve days. Oh yeah, your body still yeah. shift. Yeah. Your body still shift. Yeah. Take care of yourself, sweetie. Go for your regular checkups. Even if, but you see, you still need to see an OBGYN doctor. Yeah, I do want to go for my eyes. That 
manifester. Yeah, and you need to have her to document that in your chart. So the next time, in case you have a, another child, she has that on record, so she'll know what's going on. Thank you. You're welcome. You're <coughs> welcome. Okay, so, uh, so specification. So it does that for anatomical reasons. We have to know: does it happen in the in the arms, in the legs, in the torso, in the right torso, left torso? You know, it, it needs to have a specificity. Okay, so we'll we'll talk about those coding rules as well. Uh, right here, we'll talk. We're gonna go cover to cover. So I'm gonna take y'all through the little kindergarten style, like I did with the kindergartners for years, years ago. And we're gonna go kindergarten style uh, about the book and how to use the book. So I pretty much already talked about going volume two first and then volume one. I know it's uh, not normal. <laughs> Num number two come first and then number one, but there's a reason for that. I don't know. There's just a reason for that. Okay. Now, uh, you also have understanding the coding rules for ICD-10. Now, Ms. Harper is going to go over that simply because when I finish teaching you all of this, you need to know how to use your book. You need to know what's all in your book. Why? Because Ms. Harper's not going to be in y'all back pocket. Ms. Harper's going to move on to another class. Uh, you can call. I don't do well with voicemail. I do better with text messages because like I'm doing right now, I'm teaching. So I can always like while I'm pausing and breaking, uh, text you back. Okay. So I do better with that. Okay. Uh, so text me, email me. That's fine. But I at least want you to know how to be self-sufficient. Okay. And I'm not saying, let me look at this book before I call this over. No. I need to probably remind you, you need to go where now your coding guidelines. Find your coding guidelines. Use your coding guidelines. Okay. All right. Uh, so understanding the coding rules for ICD 10 and the same thing will be in there for ICD 9. It's the same thing. Uh, why sequencing is important. Why certain diagnosis codes should be presented first when you put it on a CMS fifteen hundred form? Okay, that's that's all uh, conclusive of money. Okay, if the person uh, has a history of breast cancer and they're coming in for, uh, let's say it's a family practice doctor, a history of breast cancer, and they're coming in for. Uh, low immunity issues, they, they feel weak, they feel tired, uh, their blood, they feel like their blood is just low, of iron, whatever like that. You need to first come in and make sure that you code whatever that issue is, okay? And then you code the history, okay? So it's really, no, you code the history and then you code whatever that issue is for that particular reason. The reason why you would code the history first uh, is simply because we got to acknowledge the fact that she had uh, breast cancer. And so due to the breast cancer, uh, late effects may occur or past present issues may occur from a past uh, illness. She has developed low immunity. And so when they go back and review the record in totality, then they can see she's been on chemo. And so sometimes those have late effects. We're going to understand what are late effects. Okay, you need to get an understanding of that. So sequencing is important, particularly if you're uh, trying to get all the money that you can. I'm not saying manipulating the claim. I'm not saying manipulating the diagnosis because so you can make the payment happen. No, there is a rhythm and a rhyme for everything. You, huh? Kind of, but not really. OK, you're just trying to make sure that stuff sequence so the so the doctor can get his correct money. All right. Uh, the second thing is CPT coding, how to look up a procedure code. OK, so we, uh, uh, Brenda and Chris have already been introduced to that. So I want to introduce that properly to all six of y'all. So y'all know how to find your uh, procedure code. So it's kind of like the same way with the CPT book, with the ICD-10 book, is, is kind of like that. You're going to start in the back and then you'll work your way to the front. Okay. Just like we broke down all six parts of the uh, CPT book. 
I broke that down so you all could be familiar with that. And then it all has its subsets. The same thing with the uh, ICD-10, they have chapters. And inside the chapters, it has its subsets, okay? So you're gonna learn how to look up uh, a procedure code. You're gonna learn what are coding symbols and rules for uh, using those coding symbols and how some of the procedure codes are obsolete or have been deleted, but they still have them documented there. Why? Because you need to understand whatever you use back last year is not going to be the same this year. For uh, diagnosis codes and procedure codes, uh, the books renew for both books. They renew every November 1st of a year every November 1st of a year. So come Halloween and all your beautiful children are in the house after y'all gone trick-or-treating and now it's 1201 November 1st, your uh, 2018 book is supposed to be a 2019 book. Now, you're probably saying, Miss Harper, but they gave us 2018. La, 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 la. Keep your 2018. I don't think they're going to change it out because you already took the wrapper off or if it came without the wrapper, it's already yours. And it's still good for coding purposes. And it's you can still kind of get away with it. But in the professional world, come November 1st, you're supposed to have a 2019 on your desk or somewhere in the office of where you work. Okay? I had some students <laughs> uh, call me... Uh, <laughs> January this year, and they couldn't understand why some of their claims was uh, bouncing back at them, none payment. I said, okay, usually the insurance companies are your friend, and so you can ask them, why is this coming back? Uh, you need to understand the code of guidelines. She said, Ms. Harper, what code of guidelines? I said, okay, let's go back in your ICD-10 book. Okay, uh, flip that page. What that say? Okay, now what that say? Find somewhere in there where it says code of guidelines. Oh, yeah. Oh, now let me ask you another question. Uh, what year is that book? Oh, it's a 2017. Although it was 2017, but as of <laughs> November 1st, we are thinking 2018. So come November 1st, this year in 2018, you're supposed to be thinking 2019. Okay, that's how they work. So for the ICD-10 book and the uh, CPT book, Every November 1st is supposed to be 2019. Now, what you have today as students uh, on your desk, or I think y'all have, what, 2018 too? Yeah. Which I have, it's sufficient for class. It's, it's cool. It's good. It may even fly and work when you get out there for externship. Well, I don't know about y'all, but y'all, it may fly and work and be okay. But just make sure wherever you go, is supposed to be a 2019 book. Okay, does everybody get that? I just can't say that enough. Okay, all right. So uh, now, all together, uh, how diagnosis codes with a procedure code must make sense. You can't say that um, you have a procedure code for, uh, what is that when babies get in the hospital time they're born? The boys, they get their uh, uh, Peter Wheeler. It's a circumcision. Circumcised. Okay. <laughs> I just can't. I'm sorry. I don't mean to sound like that. But they get circumcised. So you can't give a, a baby girl, a, a, how can I say, a checkup, and then she says she got circumcised, unless it's due to a genetic problem at birth and those sometimes do happen it's a rarity in the situation and it depends but you you can't give a newborn girl and she was born normal with all her faculties and say that you gave her a, a uh, circumcision uh, peter we cut circumcision you can't you you can't say that that's not gonna pay it's not gonna even pass through the clearinghouse it's gonna kick right back <laughs> at you okay and it's going to say you need to relook at your diagnosis code and your procedure code because it's not jive. Okay? It's not jive. Okay. Abstract and details from the soap notes. Where do we live, uh, ladies and gentlemen? Assessment. This is where we live all day long. This is where we live all day when long. Okay, you go home at five o'clock. You don't live here at five o'clock. You go home. That's a good job. Okay. 
uh, coding cases for documentation proficiency. We're going to do some coding cases. Yeah, we're going to we're going to do some y'all. Have y'all encountered any of the coding cases in week two? In week one? Have y'all looked at them? I mean, they were long cases and explained how this person had a certain situation to occur, uh, operation, la, 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 la. Well, yeah, we'll put you in depression. <laughs> Take some uh, Lexapro, you'll be all right. What is that, sweetie? In week two? Okay, yeah. So we're going to get you to understand how to properly read that and abstract information, okay? From that. Okay, how to pull a data service, that's what DOS means, for medical records request and appeal. That's what that's supposed to mean right there. So let me fix that so you don't get that confused. Okay, uh, for medical records request and appeal, you need to know how to uh, pull up an appeal, a medical records. You need to know how to uh, highlight the diagnosis code, highlight the procedure code, and some of the review of systems before you resubmit that, that CMS 1500 for the second or third time, especially if you're appealing. Not for secondary billing, especially if you're trying to appeal for payment, because sometimes they're still going to deny a claim for um, unnecessary payment due because of the first procedure. That does happen. Sometimes they'll deny because we don't have enough information. We need more information. That does happen. Or this is not a covered procedure uh, or a benefit. And sometimes you still have to cover that with a letter of medical necessity to prove that this was a payable fee. Okay. And so a medical necessity appeal. Medical necessities can come into play. Can come into play. Okay. Uh, how to complete a CMS 1500 form. Remember, we talked about uh, box 24 on Monday, right? And we talked about where the procedure go code goes, and we talked about where the modifiers go and what the modifiers do for a procedure code. It acts as a what? Adjective to give further what? definition and reason why we're trying to utilize this procedure code for payment. Remember that example that I gave y'all, that surgery example, that 56418 number or something I gave y'all. And uh, I gave y'all the first procedure code for that. That's for the surgeons of professional service. And then we use the same procedure code with a modifier 80 for assistant surgeon. Does everybody understand that? So why? Because you have to explain to them, yes, I'm using this code again, but he had an assistant surgeon or he had two assistant surgeons and they got to get paid too. So a modifier is nothing more than an adjective to further explain why you're using a procedure code. Does everybody get that? Okay, fantastic. Okay, um, and then we're going to touch on, if we don't complete, the UB04 form, okay? So now we have a lot to do today and I'm going to uh, bring up this ICD-10 uh, book. I do have it recorded on my uh, YouTube channel for once before. Uh, and you're more than welcome to go to my YouTube channel. Let me tell you what my YouTube channel name is. Uh, it is T. H C O D, and then it has a red flower on it. And for the icon, that's my page. It has a red flower. So if you see T H C O D, and it has a red flower for the icon, that would be me. Thus far, I have about 11 videos. This is video number 12. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Ooh, excuse me. Okay. Oh, yeah. Ooh. All right. 
So we have the ICD-10 CM uh, book here. Okay. This is your lifeline for diagnosis code. Okay. Do you use this book for procedure codes? No, we don't use this book for procedure code. Yes. Okay. Okay. Why you say no? Because you thought it was the other one? Okay. So those are like, that's the ICD one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the ICD-10. Okay, diagnosis code. Remember when I said that diagnosis code tells what? What about the patient? Tells what? What happens? Well, not that one. Diagnosis code, the diagnosis code tells what? Uh, kind of the history, but it tells what's wrong with the patient. Yes, yes. He is the only one next to the nurse or nurse practitioner to give a uh, clear diagnosis or a clear definition as to what is the issue with the patient. Okay. So remember, this book tells what's wrong with you. What's wrong with you? Okay. All right, so let's look at this. All right, so we, we turn the page to page three. Look at this. Now we have in a table of contents, we have the introduction, the alphabetic index. We have the different chapters, okay? We have the different chapters listed in this book. Does everybody see that? Okay, and the chapters are going to tell you a certain effect, infectious and parasitic disease. That's chapter one. No, wait, let me turn back. Let me go back. The table of contents. So let's start at the front. This one tells you about a guide to using the 2017 ICD-10-CM uh, for hospital uh, symbols and conventions, things of that nature. Okay. So let's turn to the guidelines. Guide to using, uh, no, that's not the guidelines. Guidelines is an introduction. Okay, so using the uh, ICD-10 book. So uh, go to that page where it says guide to using the 2017 ICD-10-CM for hospitals, okay? Uh, this one says instructional notations. This one says uh, includes notes, excludes notes. It has excludes two, excludes one. It has code first. Use additional codes. Okay. Can I get somebody to read that? Page three. Uh, right here. Where it says code first. Okay, go go back. Go back to the front. Okay, that, that one, one, two. Okay. Uh huh. Okay, code first. Where it says code first. Third condition have both in underlying and multiple. Body system manifestations due to the underlying etiology. 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 Uh -huh. For such conditions, the ICD 10 CM has a coding convention that requires the underlying condition be sequenced first, followed by the manifestation. Wherever such a combination exists, there is a use additional code. Note at the etiology code and, and a code first note at the manifestation. These instructional notes indicate the proper sequencing order of the code etiology followed by manifestation. Very good. Keep reading. Keep reading. In most cases, the manifestation codes will have in the code title and the disease classified elsewhere. Codes with this title are a component of the etiology manifestation convention. The code title indicates that it's a manifestation code and disease. Classified elsewhere codes are never permitted to be used as first listed or principal diagnosis codes. They must be used in conjunction with an underlying condition code. 
and they must be listed following the underlying condition. Very good, very good. So let me give you a prime example of what it's talking about. Okay, so we, we just got to talking about diabetes earlier, right? Okay, so when a person develops diabetes, okay, um, when they develop diabetes, diabetes can affect your uh, pancreas, it can affect your blood sugar, it can affect your kidneys. Uh, uh, it can affect other issues. So sometimes when a person is, okay, I give my husband for example, prime example. He's he's diabetic, okay? He's diabetic and he takes about three different <laughs> diabetic medications, okay? Homeboy just won't stop that ice cream. Homeboy just won't stop them honey buns, them, them, them donuts. Okay. <laughs> Ella Boulevard is his friend. <laughs> Shipley's? Oh, he'll he'll sit in the line for them donuts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ain't no fan of Krispy Kreme. No, we we Shipley folks in my house. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know you like Krispy Kreme, and so does my mother. My mother like Krispy Kreme. And like and where is that one at? Is it supposed to have one here? Well, they just they just came back from Houston. Park. But then they so, open up so one. Okay, I have to find it because they're supposed to have one. Um, uh, the Beltway off of 16 in South Main near Amsterdam, but it ended up being an Arby's. It, it was supposed to have been a Krispy Kreme right next door to that Golden Corral. Almost got car I remember you telling me that. Oh, Lord Jesus, that's that's awful. That's bad. But yeah, he'll sit there in line 11 30 at night. Shipley mm -hmm. Donuts is his friend. And it'd be hot, too. Mm -hmm. It'd be hot. I mean, it's a line of folks, 12, 30, 12 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. What y'all doing with Shipley Donuts that late? And it's still hot. Nobody that place would never is understand. No, huh? Nobody, nobody would never understand. I guess they won't. I guess they I won't. Know. But the other ones near my house, they closed. They they, mm -mm, they closed. So that's a that's a good Shipley's. Anytime you got to run it that late at night, it's still hot. That's a good Shipley's. Okay? Anyway. So uh, he takes medication. Now, for preventive reasons, doesn't necessarily mean he was diagnosed. Okay, doesn't mean he was diagnosed with high blood pressure. But for preventive reasons, he takes high blood pressure meds. Does everybody understand that? Okay. And for other preventive reasons, he takes cholesterol. Why is that? Because he could develop high blood pressure. So to prevent that, you have some folks that take medication to prevent that from happening. It kind of catches them a little early. You have uh, cholesterol medicines to keep them from having heart attacks and clogged arteries to keep that from happening. So the main condition, the main tree, this is a tree. This is a tree can sometimes branch off other things, okay? So this is the main diagnosis right here. Let's say hypertension is number two. Let's just say even with the eyes, he gets his eyes checked every year. He, he's, he's four eyes like me, okay? Number three, uh, then he has to watch his uh, liver, his, well, liver, yeah, but his cholesterol, okay? So you got... Three other branches coming out of one tree. Does everybody understand that? This right here is your underlying condition that can birth other things. Does everybody understand how that works? Okay. Let's see that. Okay. So thank you for reading. Uh, this also says... Use additional, uh, use additional. The words indicate an instruction to note that another code may be needed. It's going to let you know that, okay? Code first. The words indicate an instructional code that directs the coder to sequence the underlying condition before the manifestation. This is a manifestation. That's a manifestation. This is a manifestation. Not the tree. Not the underlying condition, 
the tree limbs, the branches. These are manifestations. Everybody got that? Okay. Code also unspecified. Seven characters and placeholder. Let's see. Where is that? Okay. One, two, three digits right there. That's ICD-10. Then we have three other digits behind. That's That makes it six. So we count six lines, right? That makes it six. Then you have a placeholder. It could be an alphabet of A, B, C, D, so on and so on. That makes it seven. That's what it means by seven characters. Okay. Sometimes your codes may require just three characters, uh, three digits. Sometimes your code may require four digits. It's going to give you um, instructions that this code started off with three. It's going to need a fourth digit. Here's a list of four codes with the fourth digit. Or it's going to start off with four, and it's going to give you instructions to say this, this code needs a fifth digit. Okay? We're going to see that in a minute when we start coding. Okay? Now, seven characters and placeholder. Annotated, you have annotated, you have ICD-10, CM, tablet list symbols, you have a, a red symbol that says use additional characters, you have an X for codes less than six characters that requires a seven character placeholder. So, so it's gonna say X, I want you to use X, A, X, B, X, because it's trying to give you more Pacific. Okay, we already know it was the right foot. Was it? The, the big toe, the middle toe, the third toe. So the big toe is A. The second toe is placeholder B. The third toe is placeholder C. Y'all get what I'm saying? We don't want just to know that it was the right foot. We need to know which digit of foot of toe it was. And that's okay. how you number them? That's, the book is going to already have it numbered. You just need to follow whatever they have in the, in the book, in the uh, coding book. Okay? Yeah, but so you have to use that. Okay, good question. All right. Uh, characters less than six. The seven character must always be the seven character of the code. Okay. Now, uh, unacceptable principal diagnosis. These codes have a blue dot before them and give additional information or describe the circumstances affecting the healthcare encounter but are unacceptable as principal diagnosis in the definitions of Medicare code edits for inpatient admissions, okay? Now, principal diagnosis, you're probably saying, well, what is principal diagnosis? Let me write this up here. Principal diagnosis is a term used. Hello. Hi, sweetie, go right here. You fine? You okay? Yeah, fine. Okay, is it raining out there? Not yet. Does it look like it's drizzling? Yeah, it's getting dark. It's getting dark? Yeah. Girl, what time is it? Y'all think I'm playing. <laughs> you responsible. You better keep me close. <laughs> you don't play with me. I not have told y'all don't play with me. Do you think that that's going to come? I don't. Because my mom, my mom, so I can tell my mom she's there. Okay. Oh, is your mama in the parking lot? Yeah, she she was out there in the car with the heat until she was out there. Oh, her bless her heart. So, like, if I tell her to stay or what? Uh, if she could tolerate yeah, another yeah. hour or 30 minutes, I'll let you go home. No, 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 Oh. The, the stone is not going to be here till Friday. It's not going to be here till Friday? That's what I was told. Okay. Brenda, what? It's supposed to rain, but it's not going to be like that. It's just going to rain all day. That's what it's going to be like Friday, Saturday. 60%? Okay. I think you'll be okay. But if you give me one of these numbers, <laughs> you might want to follow Okay. <laughs> just let me know, Chris. <laughs> There you go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I, I need that. Come on, come on now. I need that. All right. Thank you. I don't know why I just I never get like that. Okay. Principal. Okay. Principal diagnosis. And then you have primary diagnosis. <coughs> Interchangeably the same people. They only use this term for inpatient admission. 
Okay. Inpatient admission. This was used uh, in a doctor's uh, office. Okay. As some outpatient facilities. Okay. Some outpatient facilities. They're basically the same. They basically are the same. So if you find that they you, well, what is your principal reason for being here? It's your primary diagnosis. Well, why is, what is your primary reason for being here? It's your principal diagnosis. Are y'all getting that? The, it's the same thing. It's all in the content of how they're using that, that term, okay, and what they're used for. They're the same thing. Okay, so it's going to tell you you can't use this particular code first, okay? Now. OGCR, Official Guidelines for Coding and Reporting Symbol, uh, includes the placement of a portion uh, of, a, of a guideline as that guideline pertains to the code by which it is located. The complete OGCR are located in Part 1. Okay, so we'll talk about Part 1 in a minute. Now, you see this uh, look like orange CC. And it looks like a brown MCC. There you go, honey. I don't have my magnifying glass yes, to see MCC. this. Okay. Uh, indicates complication and comorbidities and major complication and comorbidities according to the Medicare severity diagnosis related grouping. Your, your DRGs. Your DRGs, let me write this down. Your diagnosis related grouping are used more so in inpatient uh, coding. Okay, inpatient coding. When we get it on the, uh, when, when you code from the inpatient side, you're going to use diagnosis related groupings. Let me, give me give, let me give you an example of what a diagnosis, a DRG is. Okay. Okay. So say, for example, this person has CHF. CHF means congestive heart failure. Okay. This person has congestive heart failure. And Suppose this person has diabetes, okay? And this person has had a, a trans ischemic uh, attack, a stroke, okay? So you got all these comorbidities. This congestive heart failure has triggered this and triggered that. Now, let's suppose this was a Medicare patient, okay? Now, if we're going to code on a UB04 form, sorry, I'm all over the board. If you're going to code on a UB04 form, okay, um, then you're going and you code it and you're going to send it to Medicare, you have to use a DRG number. DRG number are like weights. They have a list of them. They go by weight. So if a person has one, two, three, three comorbidities, uh, wait. If a person has a manifestation code and two other comorbidities that coexist with that, then instead of it being 0. Uh, 0.4 and this is going to be 0. 0.3 and this is going to be 0. Uh, I don't know, 5. Okay, so you add all this together. So what is 7 plus 5? 12 is a 0. 0.12. It's a 0. 0.12 weight. So when you get ready to submit that on a UBO4 form, we're going to talk about that. It's going to say, instead of charging hospitalization for, let's just say, $40,000, you're going to submit that for $40,000. But CMS is going to, uh-oh, let's be a C, sorry. CMS is going to pay you $18,000. A DRG gives you nothing more than a discounted price. For payment. Does everybody understand that? Because why? This type of person with this manifestation code and two comorbidities, they are in the hospital, in and out the hospital a lot. So can you imagine them being in and out the hospital, let's just say 10 times out of a year? 10 times out of a year at $40,000. That's $400,000 that CMS, Medicare is paying out. So they have to measure it by weight in order to say, okay. And then they have to also go along with the amount of care that they've been see, 
uh, receiving and the treatments they've been seeing. And then it have to go along with the sequence of amounts, how often they've been in the hospital with these issues. Okay. These are what you call your, your flow babies. They just flow in and out the hospital, flow in and out, in and out, in and out. They, they like your return customers, if you will. And I'm not trying to make light of the situation. I'm just trying to explain it as best as I can, because I, I have mercy on people like that. However, uh, these are the ones that, that's going to be in the hospital a lot. And remember, I told you every patient on the insurance plan, including Medicare, have a $1 million lifetime max. So again, uh, am I in your way, baby? Okay. So again, if this person is going uh, in and out the hospital ten times a year, and it's four hundred thousand dollars, four hundred thousand dollars minus one million dollars leave how much money? Okay. And person, it, it ain't even uh finished being July. We got five more months left in the year. They're gonna end, end up eating up all that money. Okay, so that's why they charge for DRG codes. That's why some codes are are are, are uh, antiquated for that. Is everybody understanding what I mean? Okay, all right. Moving right along. EX includes or indicates exclusions to complications and comorbidities. CC and major complications and comorbidities for both primary and secondary diagnosis, according to Medicare Severity Diagnosis Diagnosis Related Groupings. <laughs> okay, uh, Brenda, what is that? That's green, that's a uh, HAC? H-A-C, yeah, it's oh, green. Okay, uh, that says, uh, is a, thank you, sweetie that when present as a secondary diagnosis in an inpatient setting is uh, a higher cost, a higher volume, or both results in a higher MSDRG assignment according to uh, Medicare diagnosis related grouping. Hospital acquired condition. Those are called your nosocomial infections. Okay, again, I think I said this so many times that I don't have a problem saying it again. If you have a patient who just came out of surgery, okay, that's why they keep those uh, <coughs> surgical rooms ice cold for sterilization reasons, okay? And they close that patient up. Have y'all ever seen that, uh, what's that commercial, uh, Snickers? It was a Snickers commercial? No, it was a cell phone commercial. And that guy's cell phone was in uh, the oh, the doctor's cell phone was in his stomach. So every time the phone would ring, it would light up through his stomach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, y'all have. I think it was a Geico commercial or a Progressive commercial. It was one of those commercials. But anyway, uh, sometimes things like that happen where the scalpel is sold up in the person. Uh, all the the. Uh, cotton and whatever they use to absorb the the blood and stuff so they could see and get to the surgical area was still in a person okay uh when that person uh is sold up if you will sutured up be it by glue biodegradable reasons or by good old needle and thread you know whatever they the comfortable feel, the, the physician feels comfortable using uh, he's already being infected with that foreign object. It's called foreign object in their body. And so the person goes out into the waiting room, not the waiting room, but the holding area, you know, after surgery. And so the holding area uh, environment is, is set up a little bit lighter and different from the actual surgery room. Okay. So the person comes out, they're in the holding area. And then they go and, and they're going to be in ICU. Once they get into ICU, they still complaining of pain. Now they're infected on the inside because they did an x-ray and they found out they left a scapula inside of a person. It is really <coughs> happening. I'm going to give y'all as a, a homework, finding some cases like that online. It's really real. Okay, so now what do they have to do? They have to go back and reopen that person. And so once they go back in that operating room to reopen that person, 
you have already set them up to be infected again with open air, with anaerobes, with open air stuff. Even though it's in the surgical room and it's sterilized and it's cold, they still run the risk of being infected again because they're voluntarily being cut or voluntarily assaulted to be opened on and take that scalpel that was left in this, inside that person. Now, sometimes a person can have a great result after surgery and a lot of times you'll find, well, we'll let you go home, but you got to pass gas. Okay, they pass gas. The nurse said, oh, yeah, mm -hmm, you ready to go. Mm. So they're going to let you go home because you pass gas. Other than that, if you don't pass gas, they're not going to let you go home. Why is that? Can anybody tell Did they make you pass gas? No, they didn't, but they did it to my sister. They did it to your sister? Yeah, I remember the room that to me, but I remember my sister. They were like, if you do not eat, like, a uh, bar or use the restroom, you like, you cannot go home. You can't go home. They don't know if something was that's right and what did you say sweet pea yeah yeah That's yeah my right yeah very good but they also do it to a bariatric patient i've been a bariatric patient you know i had to or you know make sure mm -hmm. she, you know that's embarrassing yeah. but to them it's a good sign any other surgery because when they close you up they not they're not only just closing you up they're closing up the air the environment inside of you too OK, so again, that patient, uh, the surgery turned out well. Uh, everything is fine. The person doesn't have fever. The person passed gas. Oh, my goodness. We let you go home. And somewhere intermittently while they're going through the discharge process, they're you know, they waiting. All of a sudden, the temperature goes up. OK, the temperature goes up to like 100, 101. That's a concern. The person started getting chills and fever. That's another concern. Okay, what just happened? What just happened? Okay, so somebody must have walked into the room, must have carried a germ or something from outside, unbeknownst to you, the visitor, unbeknownst to them, the arm, and suddenly they're sick. Okay, their fever has gone up. They're getting chills and little sweats and whatever. So now they got to keep the patient. Okay. That's called a nosocomial infection. Okay. Those are hospital acquired type things because it's environmental. Sometimes a person can go home and the next two days, something with the environment at home didn't sit right with their body. Okay. They got to come right back. Those are called hospital acquired infections. Somewhere between you leaving the hospital and you coming home, you got sick. That's nosocomial. Okay. All right. Manifestation code. Age conflict detects the inconsistencies between a patient's age and diagnosis. So, for example, a five-year-old patient with benign prostate hypertrophy or a seven, eight-year-old uh, pregnant female. Okay. Uh, now, I know, what was that actress, Bridget Nielsen? Nielsen? Yeah. She had a baby at 54. OK, Janet Jackson had her baby at what, 50. So that's kind of becoming a common trend for women, I guess, over 50 having babies. OK, but if, if you find that you billing somebody or is going through the clearinghouse to the insurance company saying uh, a lady was pregnant or she had a baby at 78 years old, that's going to be very questionable. And it's going to be like, how did they get through the clearinghouse to us? OK. Oh, what do you mean by that? Why? Okay, very good question. Let's suppose that the diagnosis said uh, vaginal birth at the time of delivery. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the diagnosis. She had a vaginal birth and her age is 78 years old. I'm not trying to be discriminatory, mm -hmm. but everything else. And her record says that she came in for a hip replacement. But you but you misrepresented or you miscoded and put it that she had a vaginal delivery mm -hmm. or she had a C-section. Mm. OK, as questionable of the coder. Is it because of her prior, um, her prior surgeries? It's not because of her prior surgeries. It's just that she's older. OK, that's that's questionable. Yeah. And then number one, the revenue codes. We're going to talk about the revenue codes. The revenue codes say that she's been in the hospital for a week. 
The revenue code says, or other, uh, uh, your 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 inpatient procedure your inpatient procedure codes are two digit codes. Okay, it's saying that she had a hip replacement. Your procedure code says you had a hip replacement. Your revenue code say that you've been in a hospital for a week and you also received a walker. But the diagnosis code says, "Hey, sweetie, I'm, just help yourself, help yourself, sweetie." But the diagnosis code says that she had a baby. Now, how are you going to have a diagnosis code? She had a baby. Procedure code says she had a hip replacement. She got a walker to go home with, and she's been in the hospital for a whole week. So, basically, they didn't put on the codes. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't give the correct diagnosis code for her procedure. That's why I said your diagnosis code and your procedure code have to make sense. Uh, is it two different codes or is it the same code? It should be same or similar. So if she had a, a hip placement procedure, then it should be, it should say the diagnosis code should say hip fracture. Or she slipped and fell at home. Or she slipped and fell in a tub. It should be maybe an injury uh, code to say she slipped and fell at home on her right hip or her left hip. Or it should say she had deterioration of the bone of her right hip or her left hip. Her diagnosis code should say something about a hip injury or a hip illness. Now, if she went in there and she had a baby, that, that procedure code is going to say she was on the table pushing and she injured her hip. Yeah. But the documentation has to be there. But it would still be questionable yeah. for her to be 78 years old. I'm not saying God don't work miracles. He can't. If he did it with Sarah, hey, he could do it for her. Very good. There's no discrim discrimination on that. But the documentation has to be there. The principal diagnosis for her being in the hospital has to be there for that. But that's a very good question. Okay? But it has to all make sense. It has to all be there. That's what you have to watch out for fraud. Yeah, oh, come on. Say that again. You got to watch out for fraud, honey. Because you got some folks, they'll create some of anything. With a person's identification and said that this really happened and it didn't happen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah. That's what I'm asking. So it's like basically, like the doctors, you know, they can create false codes yes. and charge. They can't create false codes. That it has to be codes out the CPT book. It has to be codes out the ICD-10 book. You mean they can misrepresent codes? There you go. There you go. They put you on your right arm. They put you out of and they pocket the rest of the money, and they give you twenty five hundred of it. Oh, okay, I get it. So it's kind of like where, well, I'm like the conference team, like they making money off of it. Yeah. More money. Yeah, okay. I know it's real big in the world. But it's like, but that's bad for the patient, all right? Because as a patient, we don't know how to read the code. We're just getting a bill in the mail, and we just look like, okay, well, we don't know what it means. We're thinking that that's what we went to the doctor for, but they know what they did. So now we're stuck with this bill, but we know nothing about it. We don't know how to read the code. Well, there's a fraud, though. Mm-hmm. And they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna contact the patient with a letter. Yeah. But even though, even though what ends up happening, very good. What ends up happening is they'll send a patient whatever the e, whatever the EOB copy get at the provider's office. The patient is going to get the same thing about themselves. So they have to catch the fraud in order for it to be noticed. Like they have to catch it. Yes, but they don't and always catch it, right? Because not all the time. Okay, unless you got a a, a well educated type patient who's curious about money and they know that a hundred thousand dollars for to deliver a baby that's unheard of yeah. that's totally unheard of uh, well, yeah, yeah. That's another question I was going to ask about that. Like, are some patients aware of, like, because it's considered insurance fraud, right? Because mm -hmm. insurance is paying for it, but they have to send a check. So they cut the patient a check, like, if you know about it, and they're cutting the patient a check from it. 
They're, yeah, they're not cutting the patient a check. They're cutting the provider a check. Well, yeah, they cut them a check, but then the provider's giving that patient because everybody eating under the table, something, right? Something like that? Kind of like that, but sometimes it's unbeknownst to the patient. Most of the time it's unbeknownst to the patient unless the patient is in on it. And that those yeah. are very rare to happen. Okay. Who, whoever gets a part of it, it would be the physician. It would be sometimes the, the coders and the builders that work in the office. So sometimes it could be the physicians and they and they co-laborers that, that are practicing medicine with them. Yeah. But can the coder get in trouble if they know nothing about it? Yes, ma'am. They go to jail. Wait. <laughs> Even if they don't know. Now, here's the thing. Um, but they, it does happen. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. You're not in the wrong field. No. <laughs> It's all about education, Dr. baby. Dr. It's a, that's what I said. Thank you, sweet. Documentation is everything. When you get hired, I don't care if it's at a sole proprietor practice where it's just a one-man position and you working there. You need to make sure that they have on the letterhead that you were hired at this particular date for this amount of money. And you keep that at your house. So that, uh, what, what is it called? A ward letter of hire? Yeah, offer letter. There you go. An offer letter of hire. So when stuff come back with days of service that's before your time, that has nothing to do with you. Now, if you find that your doctor is doing this and there's a trend and you're doing the accounts receivable, you better be the whistleblower. You need to call the Office of Inspector General and be the whistleblower. Don't they have a show called The Whistleblower? So you're like, you know, for the time you got to be snitched. Pretty much. <laughs> I'd rather get stitches than go to jail. Well, hey. <laughs> That's how it roll, baby. That's how it roll. It's all about them decisions. It's all about them decisions. There you go. But it's just so crazy, like, in a medical field that which, I mean, the medical field will sound right that there's a lot of fraud going on. Yeah. There's so much money involved. But you would think that it wouldn't be because it's such a sensitive thing that you're playing with people's lives. Yes. And it is. And it's, it's crazy. Like, you know, they got auto fraud and home fraud, but it's yeah. like hospital fraud. Like, you like, got some insensitive people out there who don't care. Don't care. They learn the craft. They know how to get over on it. And it's really sad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know when I worked at Prudential Insurance, um, when I first came to work for them in 97, they were located, uh, not Greenway Plaza, that was another insurance company I worked for. They were at uh, Maryland, Maryland and 16, Beach and 16. And then they moved from Maryland to Sugarland. Off uh, Florida Daniel Drive. It's still Florida Daniel Drive out there. They just don't have the Prudential building out there. So my point is, uh, I was on the fraud division team where I had to analyze and look at and verify all of these uh, physicians who made up uh, uh, lock boxes. <coughs> They're legitimate lock boxes. Pretty much a lock box is no more than a PO box. They made up these lock boxes, but they made up different social security numbers. They made up who they were as a physician. And they had these, they were filing these claims and they had these claims going to these lock boxes. And we had to uh, credential every physician that was legitimate. We had to get their malpractice uh, insurance, their W 9, all like that, their license, their uh, state board, and all like that, just to legitimize who they were. And sometimes these doctors don't even know that they builders and coders are getting over on them. Oh, honey, it's it's terrible. I had a client like that, and she that's why I let her go. I, I put it in writing. I said, anything after this day is not my fault. Because why? I try to tell you. I put it in email, try to tell you. I try to tell you this, you weren't listening. I try to tell you when you have some time out, let's have a conversation about this. I ain't trying to take up all your weekend. I just want to have 30 minutes of your time to have a conversation. Okay, you're not trying to get with me. Uh, sign the dotted line, please. We are done. Goodbye. And that's why I put it in email. Email is your friend. Documentation is everything. Yes, sir. Well, you, I don't know if it was the best thing where you want to be nosy. You want to be in with your doctor. Because, like, you just something. 
Yes. If you notice a trend is not right as far as documentation, uh, and he's giving extra procedure codes and there's no reason for that procedure code, then it has no diagnosis there to state that the, the doc, I'm sorry, there's no information to state for that procedure. There's no information to state for that diagnosis code. Then you need to say, doctor, you know, or the nurse, you want to go to the nurse first. You want to go through the protocol hierarchy. But some doctors, you know, ain't always as approachable. So you want to go to the nurse and say, you know, I'm kind of questioning is, you know, is he sure right. about that? Yeah. Yeah, baby. Let me help you. You have some doctors who play like they guard. They have the guard complex. I know you will. <laughs> and then you have some who are humble. You do. You do. But the ones that have the God complex, they ain't got time, they're irritated with you. You, you can kind of pick up vibes, you know? Go to the nurse about it. And then sometimes you got nurses that are like, mm, uh, well, I need you to answer that. You just got to, you just got to have thick skin and just... They don't realize that we're the one having them that like, Yeah. Numbers. But they got, they got friends that are lawyers. Their, law, their friends going to get them out. It's best, and not always, but as best as they can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why Oprah says, anytime I love Oprah, even with her money, she counts her money, she checks her money frequently and often. Can you blame the sister? No, you can't. Yeah. Yeah, especially when you famous like that, yeah. But we're digressing. Huh? Uh -huh. Yeah. And baby, let me tell you something. I've heard she had people that work for her. They signed disclosures. You can't talk about nothing of her business out in the streets. Mm -mm -mm. You signed a disclosure. Yeah. You should. You should never be lazy about your money and about your business. Yeah, of course. Mm Mm-hmm. You gonna find out some stuff. Damn. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. But does that answer your question? Um, you tired? Okay. It was another point I was trying to go at with that, and I can't remember what my point was. But when it does, I'll come back to it because I can't remember what I what else I was gonna say to that. Okay. All right. Very good class. I'm just enjoying y'all. I'm just enjoying y'all in spite of the weather. I'm enjoying it. Okay, so moving right along, y'all. So do y'all understand that about that age conflict? It's not that I'm being discriminatory about a 78 woman or an 80-year-old woman. Hey, there's a woman 80 years old and lifting pumping weights. Okay, she better than me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you have some folks, they take good care of themselves or they got good genes. Sometimes they just got good bones. <laughs> Maybe go out and play golf. Yeah. 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 Hey, accidents do happen. What is it, dear? Yeah. 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 But I think it's a beautiful thing. I, I applaud Bridget Nelson. I, I think it's a beautiful her, Janet Jackson. I think it's a beautiful thing. You know. <laughs> yeah. She got married. How many times Janet Jackson been married, y'all? Like 20. Yeah. I don't know where I've seen it she recently that she was a virgin, that she was swearing she was a virgin or something. She ain't no virgin. She ain't no virgin. Well, she's a jack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she ain't no virgin. She ain't no virgin. Latoya, I think that's Latoya you oh, talked about. Latoya, yeah, yeah Le- she ain't no virgin. <laughs> she ain't no virgin. 
What is that? They got uh the, the, the new thing, a born again version. No, nah, baby. Once you've been lit, you already been lit. <laughs> <laughs> nah, boo. You've been lit and hit. Stop it. Stop it. Okay? Just stop it. Say, I done had myself controlled and covered. Okay? <laughs> no. Nah. No, nah, you've been lit and hit. Okay. Uh, <laughs> y'all make it call Miss Harper come on un unglued. Okay, here we go, y'all. Uh N. You have N for newborn, P for pediatric. We're still talking about manifestation codes. M for maternity age. Uh, there we go. That Bridget Nielsen right there. A for adult uh, age range. Um, ooh, 15 to 124 years of, of age. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, it happens, honey. 124? It happens. Who, who said that just recently died? Mm -hmm. Senator John McCain? Yeah. His mother's 106. She surpassed her son's age, and he was what 81? He was four days away from being 82. And she 106 and kissed her son's casket goodbye. That's hard. That's hard. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Good genes or genetics. I don't understand that. If he was smoking, it was God's herb. No, it's kidding. <laughs> Well, it's true, 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 true. Yeah. Well, now there's a tree of choice. Do not eat of this tree. He did see. He did say, "Don't eat of this tree." Now, I think that was a forbidden tree. Well, find it, find it, find marijuana in there. I dare you find it, and you let me know. No, you can get an A for the day, but not the rest of the time. Oh, it's in there. I was shocked somebody so. Or you find it. Find it and show it to me. Okay, y'all, let's keep going. Sex conflict. Okay, you got that. These are children that are that sometimes that are born with both. And you and the parent has to make a decision uh if they want to choose their child to be this or be that. Yes, homorphodites. Okay. So sometimes you have to let the child kind of if you get it, how can I say it? if you get it corrected when they newborn. Uh, it's kind of hard. It, it is kind of hard. But then what if they develop and something else stirs up? Yeah. Okay. That, that, so you kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I I, I would kind of, if, if it was me, I would kind of wait and see how the child would, which way are you going? Then, then we'll get it corrected. You know, that's just me. Genesis 1 and 29. What did it say? God said, Behold, I give you every plant with a seed that on the face of all the earth. Let me look at my commentary. I don't know about that, Chris. See, 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 see. I'm, I'm a Bible thumper, so I'm going to research that. That's what it says. That, that, that's what it says, but I'm, I'm going to go deeper on that. I'm going to go deeper on that, Chris. You messing with me. I don't do it, though. I'm sure you don't. No, I, I, I swear to God, I don't. Okay. I have a security plan. I understand. I understand. Okay, coding clinic. So sometimes as a, a medical coder, uh, you're going to get lo those, uh, what do you call that? <laughs> he lying, ain't he, Bruno? Yeah, he lying. I know it. Uh, <laughs> coding clinics. Coding clinics are your sheets and your flyers that you receive in-house while you're learning how to code, it tells you the latest changes before the new uh, book is published for November 1st. Okay, those, those are what coding clinics are. Okay, let's go to the next page, symbols and conventions. Okay, so all these symbols and conventions is telling you what they're used for uh, and, and it gives an examples of how they're being used. Okay, go on to the next page. Okay, so guide to use the 2017 or maybe yours is 2018. These go by chapters. There's 21 chapters in this uh, diagnosis code book, okay? Chapter one is uh, infectious and parasitic diseases. Chapter two is neoplasms. Chapter three is disease of blood and blood forming organisms and certain disorders. Uh, involving the immune mechanism. Chapter four talks about the endocrine nutrition and metabolic diseases. 
uh, chapter five talks about mental behavior and neurodevelopment disorders. Uh, chapter blah, 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 blah. What is chapter six, y'all? I know, that's what I'm saying. There you go, sweetie. Thank you. Diseases of the nervous system. Have y'all noticed that every time you look at a chapter, it starts with another alphabet? Oh, yeah. So if you notice that you in the chapter that begins with G's is dealing with the nervous system. Chapter seven, it begins with H's. It talks about the I and the indexa. Chapter eight. No, yeah, there it is. Chapter eight is also inclusive of H. That's your ear, nose, and throat type uh, diagnosis codes. Uh, your ear and your mastoid process. This is your, your mastoid process, okay? Sometimes you get those TMJ issues. Sometimes you get those mandibular infections uh, where it has certain uh, uh, sagittal sinus holes in the, in, in the bone of your jaw. And sometimes you feel like you had that sinus infection and your face hurt or your jaw hurt. It's because that sinus infection is going through the holes of, those, of your uh, mandible area. Okay, so now you have the disease of the circulatory system that begins with I. Now you have the next chapter. Give me just a minute. Next chapter is 10, the respiratory system that begins with J. Uh, chapter 11, disease of the digestive system that begins with K. But you see how it makes it easier for you? So you already know if you work for a gastroenterologist, uh, physician, all your diagnosis codes pretty much. 80% of your calls are going to come from the K section, okay? Everything else you're going to have to kind of, you know, research it. Uh, infection, I'm sorry, disease of the skin and subcutaneous, that's L. Uh, musculoskeletal system and connective tissue, that's M. That's, that's chapter 13. Chapter 14 is disease of the deuterinary system that begins with N. N is in Nancy. In as the name. Well, I'm already at ninety percent. You say charge works. Okay. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Pregnancy, childbirth, and puerperium. That's going to be in all this chapter 15. Chapter 16 is certain conditions originating in a uh, perinatal period that begins with P. That's chapter 16. Chapter 17 is congenital malformations. Deformations and chromosomal ab abnormalities. Okay. Okay. So, so you have a uh, okay. So uh, deformation and chromosomal abnormalities, like atresia of the aorta, interruption of the aorta, aorta arch, congenital mouth uh, malformation. So, say for example, I had a nephew. My brother's first son uh, was born with a hole in his heart. Okay, he was born like a blue baby, and he uh, had his umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck, so it was choking around. Okay, but he had a, a hole in his heart. It, it, his heart didn't fully close. Well, it's more than a heart murmur, uh, but it was uh, considered one of the uh, diagnoses as a heart murmur. But he had a hole in his heart, meaning that when the blood flows from two chambers to three chambers, it's leaking. <coughs> So it's not flowing the way it should flow. Okay, so that's a congenital defect. A child can be born with uh, an an arm but no hand. That's a congenital defect. Uh, a child can be born. Uh, what is that mosquito uh, disease uh, with, with pregnant women? A child is born normal but they have no brain. They have uh, no brain. Yeah. Like, Zika. Zika virus. That yeah, it's yeah, fully 
develop except their brain is no brain meaning that it's it's, it's a brain there but it's not fully developed it's it's oh, flat it's not functioning, it's not functioning. It's not functioning. and they don't live very long Me too. <laughs> yeah it, it they, they, their head is flat okay when babies are born their their bones are soft like cartilage you ever notice that uh, a mom when they hold their babies they're they're Cupping their head, head. they shaping their head. Yeah, that. you have to cup their head. Yeah, the perfect little circle head. I laid down, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can happen. Like, What's wrong? You know? Yeah, he's one. Yeah. Okay, so his head, his skull is not quite meshed together, so you can still kind of like cup it, like, but like touching it. Not just touching it, but you're gonna have to kind of like like firmly a cup it. yeah, just Quiet. firmly cup it. Yeah, I can reshape it. Yeah, my grandmother did that. She, my grandmother, uh, was was always uh, how can I say about our nose? She was always conscious about our nose. She didn't want us to have wide fat noses. My grandmother, so she would always pull our nose. What? Yeah, so we would have straight noses. Because she was conscious about our nose. She didn't want us to have wide noses. So she would always pull. Yeah, you can shape it. Yeah. Hold it and pull. And then it'll it'll just develop over time like that. My sister had like a lump in her nose right there. And she and I don't remember where she got that. But she tried to pull her nose all the time. She thinks she's gonna form it. No. <laughs> that's, that's where I heard that from. Yeah. Like, oh no, 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 no. Now that may be a a, a, a bone malformation. It, does she snore? How old is your sister? She's uh, about to be seventeen. About to be seventeen. Does she have breathing issues? She had that one. Okay. Yeah. She can get that. Uh, they can go in and and. And smooth it down for her. Yeah, that's a that's a um, I forgot, but that's a cartilage area. That's a soft bony area that they can fix. They can correct that. Mm -hmm. Just make sure that when she goes, she get a good surgeon, and she goes no more than one or two times. But after that, you'll be like, my day. <laughs> and surgery that you have to do that? Yeah. Yeah, they have to cut it open. It's cartilage in here. So they can kind of cut through it, or if it's to the bony part, the bony part of your nose starts right yeah. back up in here. So they would probably have to chisel that down and file the thing. The, the, I had a, um, I had broke my nose, I think. And, um, <laughs> this, this um this part of my bone like split crack, like like you know, they wanted to give me surgery on my nose too. Uh, did you do it? Do you didn't do it? it? It's still like I could feel it kind of like. Uh, like okay, then you need to be careful, you know, uh, because God forbid in case something happens, there's still a broken bone that can travel, or God forbid have an accident, it can make it worse. Okay, let's keep reading the chapters, y'all. I'm enjoying the conversation. All right. I can't see it, honey. Okay. Signs. Okay, we talked about. Okay. Uh, 17 to 18. Thank you, sweetie. Signs and symptoms and abnormal clinical and laboratory findings not elsewhere classified abnormalities uh, of the heartbeat, cardiac murmur. Okay, that's one Chris was talking about and you were talking about. Nausea and vomiting. Okay, all those different. Uh, types of uh, diagnoses. 19, injury, poisoning, and certain other consequences of external causes. Fractures, the base of the skull, right. Fractures, base of the skull to the left. Okay, uh, those different kind of things. Uh, poisoning. Poisoning is, uh, let's say you took some Tylenol <coughs> Uh, about 30 minutes ago and you have to eat a Papacitos with your friend 
and you you feeling okay because I'm not having those cramps or pain or I'm not having a headache. So you decide you want to have a margarita. You get reaction. Well, not an allergic reaction, but let's suppose your body it, that that Tylenol is still working its way in the circulatory system. So now you're feeling a little bit abnormal than nor than normal. You're not supposed to mix alcohol and, med and medicine, not even over the counter, or alcohol, alcohol and prescriptions. Okay, because what ends up happening is um, you poison yourself. So sometimes you can cause yourself to pass out. Sometimes you cause your own death. You know, and that's where they do those toxicologies. They can tell how much alcohol you had in your body. They could tell when the last time you had some alcohol in your body. They could tell when the last time you had a certain medication. They could tell what kind of medication you had in your body. Like, that's how we understand. Like, people do be going to autopsy. Like, how can they just tell me, like, oh, he got it since this time. He'd be dead for this time. Like, how can they do this? Decomposing, decomposing, how fast the body is decomposing. Yeah. And, like, what type of bugs are inside the body? If it's, like, five. Yeah. You could say five doesn't look like and they do uh, blood reports they can tell histology histology as far as like history of your um, the natural tissues of your body they can tell uh, how long you've been dead they can tell what absorption you had just by putting in certain solutions and rebirth your uh, just like okay let me give you a prime example by what I mean who all like jerk beef jerky? Okay, you like beef jerky. Of course, you military, so you, you would know about that. You yeah, okay, she military too, so you would know about that, right? Because y'all y'all hardcore, y'all be y'all be in the field. So y'all hardcore. And y'all all out in the field, right? And so y'all, y'all eating at a what you say that was? Well, we eat the MRE, so yeah. Yeah, the brown MREs. <laughs> the what? Brown the brown bag specials. There you go. Yeah, I don't know how. Mm. Anyway, I know. Oh well, I'm glad you liked it. My brother's a marine and he loved it. Yeah, he even even eat romaine noodles out straight out the package, uncooked. His kids do the same thing. It's cooked, but it's dry. Oh yeah, I love sardines. Same exactly. If you eat sardines, you can eat any part. But see, the MRE they put a gum up in there. Y'all have gum in y'all. It's like you get a gum in there, and the gum is to make you, you know, make you number two pass on it because it's packaged food. So you have to keep the gum there. But in a few minutes, you're gonna be like. Remember they used to have those gum back in the day. No, it was gum. You chew the gum, it makes you, it makes you go. Oh, yeah, yeah I remember so, that. Yeah, it's like a little bit of gum. But they will put them in the MRE after you eat them. And everybody usually like eat the food first. Then if you don't eat that gum, trust me, my friend has experienced that. And he didn't most direction for like nine days. Yeah, and it's like, you will be back up. Oh, yeah. gonna see it wasn't it. nice, and he decided to think he actually went. Like, it was like, I don't know, it's really bad. Like, that food is. <laughs> well, anyway, let me get let me back, get back to my illustration. <laughs> Thank you, Bits. Um, beef jerky. Okay, now beef jerky is nothing more than seasoned dried meat. Okay, hydrogenated dried meat. You put that put just just season you some good thin uh, steak. Put it on a nice uh, what do you call that a uh, baking sheet with uh, the wax paper and put it in the oven and let it bake on 200 or 175 for a period of hours. And you got beef jerky. Okay, You put soy sauce and let it bake up and you got jerky, but it has to bake slow over time. So it can still be <coughs> edible. Okay, you can't cook it on 375 and 350. It has to be 175 or 200 over some hours. Okay, now if I take some beef jerky and I put it in some water, that beef is gonna come back flimsy and pliable. Okay? I can.
that that uh, what you call it, medical examiner can go in and get what he need and tell what was the last thing you ate, what was the last chemical you ate, and everything. It's just like dried blood. Okay, you ever uh, had a cut as a kid? You scraped your knee. Like a scab. A, well, yeah, like a scab. But you 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 were running to mama, and you had blood uh -huh. footprints all the way to the to the porch, mm -hmm. right? And so there's blood footprints all the way to the porch. They can take that with that with that solution with a swab and still could tell your DNA. They could tell what was the last thing you had in your body. They could do all kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So even like the drop blood from the wall. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that's all like, like when somebody gets killed and they have no idea. Yeah, yeah. They, they can tell like, you're male or female. Like, oh, they can tell when you're male, female. Yep. Yeah. I took a, I took a class, a name that came down last year, and like, like if you find decomposed bones, it's like just, it's like just the math, it's like big math problems that you have to do to, like you'll find out your height, your weight. How long you been dead and all this stuff like that, your age and all that. Forensics. So even if the blood like fell on the wall, they say like three like, they still can yeah. use it. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so oh, okay, what if what if the person is uh mm -hmm. okay, say that they died in like a fire. Okay, mm -hmm. and they body decomposed in the fire? Yeah. So how would they <sighs> that's kinda of hard. Yeah. 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 DNA. Like, DNA. if they have still attached to one, like, if they have still on there, like, if pieces of hair still on there, they can use that too. Like, it's like, it's like, I'm talking about, like, if you burn, you know, like, if you burn, everything just burns. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Like, do something. I imagine they could. Not that much, I don't know. But I imagine they could. They could find something with those ashes. It's like, once you, um, it's like, once you, once you gather everything up, it's like, I forgot that the thing she said, which you do to it, like to ask or whatever, like, okay, say if somebody, they've been missing for a while, and you're like, oh, we found this, uh, we found uh, dead corpses, stuff like that, like, they would be like, how much did she weigh, what age is she, and stuff like that, they would use the wrong to identify the price, I'm like, identify, be like, oh, well, she's around the same age as her, the way, and all this stuff like that, it's like way to the handle. Just touching a coffee cup can tell because your fingerprints. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. That's what people mess up. Yeah, I do too. I don't like the TV. So even like, you know, when they like, when someone shows me a lipstick thing and they like, lipstick print. Oh, yeah. A tube of lipstick still has old cells from you putting it on your lips. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Every time you put on lipstick, you 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 putting on more cells without that lipstick. That's why when I used to be a makeup artist and I uh, would use the lipsticks, I don't never go back over the lipstick. I don't, I don't never use the lipstick for everybody. I would, you know. Do it one time this on this side of the tube. Well, uh, what do you call that? Q-tip. One side on this side of the Q-tip and another side on that. I don't know where your mouth been. Because, you know, like with the lipstick, the more you do it, the more it goes down. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you would think of like when you're putting it on, it's kind of like just a layer. Yeah. After you use it, it's still that new layer on there, but it still has your cells on there. Yes, sir. So, like, speaking of, like, diseases and stuff, somebody's like, they may have a slight chance of developing a cold sore because you have to remember it's made out of oil it's made out of wax oil tends to collect things you know like uh, I've had somebody to uh, want me uh, to contract me to do a funeral home do makeup on dead people you know um, I, I I didn't take that contract, but if I had taken that contract, it would be a separate kit that I use on dead people. I would not use it on live people. Okay, so I mean, dead people, did you use the same kit on? I mean, they're dead. 
Well, yeah, on each person, yeah, because it doesn't matter at this point. But still, you know, uh, because of contamination, yeah. this contamination, and everything, just like mascara, you know, uh, things can happen. You know, as the body decomposes, it goes through changes, and so does anything else that lands on it. It goes through changes. It goes through change. Your body is still alive. God, okay, like my father, he passed away. What ninety five? If I need mm -hmm. DNA to prove something, I can go <laughs> to his grave, dig up his casket, and get some hair off his head, and it'll still breathe up his DNA. It'll breathe up for his DNA and my DNA. It can still live. That's why when they say, and when Cain killed Abel, the blood of Abel was crying out from the earth. You can't kill DNA. You can't. It is amazing. What about with ashes? You can do your DNA test. With ashes? Yeah. Uh, now, that much, I don't know. We can look that up. That's a great assignment to look up, yeah. but I, I don't know. Like ashes, ashes from the body? Yeah. 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 That part I don't know. I mean, that is a good question because if like, somebody gets cremated, but they need that DNA from that person or something, can you get that from the I imagine you could. Bone what is it? Bone the bone fragment is still there? Okay. Okay. I'm, I wouldn't doubt it. Oh, okay. Bless your heart. Well, I, um, my dad. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, I imagine you can still tell a lot about a person through their ashes or, or bone fragments. Yeah. Those are very good questions, ladies. I love it. Very good questions. But, girl, yeah. Mm -mm. Mascara? How do I know you just got over pink eye? Some men. Yeah. 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 There you go. Yeah. Okay, so chapter 19, chapter 20. Moving right along, people. External causes of comorbidity. Transport accidents, people falling off of forklifts, people ha having accidents on uh, what do you call it? Amtrak train, some trains. Uh, the ones in New York. Yeah, subways. Yes. And they'll tell you like not to stand. Oh, but I mean, you know, they're like they're from New York, so they don't care. They'll just be on that line, and when the train comes, they're standing right there over the other, and the train is like this close to them, and they're just so they and they can just walk straight in. And I thought that was crazy because I was kind of upset, like I don't know what's going on, but yeah, because they can't, they can't stop, and they, they, they just don't. But people do stand over like. I don't know how people can do that and not be slapped. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know you slapped. No, don't get slapped. Don't get slapped. No, kidding. Yes. Oh, you need to take Yes. Okay. I know. Step out for you. Yes. Good. Good. Hey, tell me your name again. Miss Johnson. Mr. Johnson. Yes, I'm Miss Harper. It's nice to meet you. Nice sorry. to meet you again. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Stay right there. <laughs> <laughs> no, you fine. Thank you. That's okay. That's very okay. Okay, chapter 21, factors influencing health status and contact with health services. <laughs> that is observation and evaluation of newborn for unspecified cardiac condition, blase, blase, carrier of infectious disease encounter for prophylactic measures, blase, blase. Okay, now we're going on to introductory one, people. Now, this is the chapter right here you need to 
really get to know. I'm not saying know this by heart. I'm saying be familiar with it. Let me put this up here to the screen so y'all can remember what I said. I said this right here, right here. Okay, it, look, it should look like this. There you go, pumpkin. Okay. It should look like this. So this is official guidelines for coding and reporting. This comes from the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services and the National Centers of Healthcare Statistics. Remember, we talked about <coughs> statistics the other day. I love statistics. Oh, that's my favorite subject. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Because you get to uh, quantify use a certain calculations to understand what happens in a particular region of the world or a particular region of a continent or a country. Compare it to other countries, okay? Compare it to other regions of the United States. You have the North region, you have the South region. I think it's Connecticut, Rhode Island, East, East Coast? Yes. And California, West Coast, right? I always get that mixed up. But you, you, you compare all where that comes from. Your Gender is a, is, is a statistic. Your, your race is a statistic. Your age is a statistic. Where you live, your economic status is a statistic. Uh, so all of that plays a role in how things get acquired and put in the ICD-10 book and how the uh, statistics are being handled according to procedures in the CPT coding book, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna let y'all read that for your enjoyment, your personal pleasure. Okay, so let's go over here. Section one, conventions and general guidelines, chapter Pacific guidelines. It's telling you what to do all about that. Uh, moving on to the next page over, it says a selection of principal diagnosis. It tells you how to handle that. Uh, the next page is telling you reporting of additional diagnosis, diagnostic coding and reporting guidelines for outpatient services. Present on admission, recording guidelines, conventions, and general coding guidelines, and chapter specific guidelines. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, move around along. That's a lot of information in there just for that. Ooh, Jesus. Okay, keep flipping. Keep flipping. Keep flipping. Ooh, okay, keep flipping. Mm. 41. Okay, thank you, sweetheart. Okay, thank you. Now, the next one talks about a uh, selection of a principal diagnosis. Then the next one talks about reporting additional diagnosis. Then the next one talks about diagnosis coding and reporting guidelines for outpatient services. Uh, going on, going on, going on, going on. Okay, Appendix 1, present on admission reporting guidelines, okay? All right, now, this is talking about Netter's anatomy illustration. So the reporting guidelines, as you can tell, it's very thorough. Um, they do have the ICD-10. I think there's an app for that or something online for that. So you can do like control F and type what you're trying to find as far as the guideline, and it'll take you straight to that word. I'd rather that than trying to go through this book and try to find stuff. But try on your own time. Be familiar with that, okay? So you can be proficient coders. Okay, the Natter's Anatomy Illustrations, okay? Now, uh, who watches the show called, who ever seen the show called Good Doctor? You know, yeah, okay. Good doctor. Okay, good top doctor is about this boy with uh, this man with uh, autism. Yeah, he has autism. Okay, and notice how whenever there's a surgical case that's happening, he's already picturing in his head how that part of the body should be functioning, right? Mm -hmm. And he's he's picturing every detail of that body, right? 
Um, and by him knowing the detail, the anatomy of that particular part of the body, he also understands the physiology of that body. Now, you're probably asking, well, Miss Harper, why am I why am I listening to this? OK, I'm glad you asked. It is simple because when you do coding, you need to kind of think. OK, when I code this, does that make sense? OK, that OK. Well, I can see the doctor doing that procedure, but. Why am I going for that procedure? Some things might query your mind to go there. Well, if he did this procedure, this procedure should cut and do this. No, this should be global. This should be separate. This should be global. You know, you kind of have to think like that when you are a coder. You have to be nosy and you have to have a, a, a vivid imagination to remember or understand the anatomy and physiology of the body. OK, so sometimes at some point we're going to learn that anatomy physiology of the body. OK, so that's why you have this there. So it behind you all the netters anatomy uh, illustrations going through here. Let's go to the gray part of the book. Mm. Gray part of the book. Now, gray part of the book says index to diseases and. This is the alphabetic index. The alphabetic index is volume two. It looks like this. Anybody understand that? Alphabetic index, the first page. Turn it back one time. There you go. Okay, so volume two. This is the first page. Okay, volume two in the front, volume one in, in the back. Okay, kind of the second in line. Okay, so now you're probably asking me, well, Miss Harper, why it got volume two in the front, volume one in the back? Very good. So when you find your disease, you need to verify if that is correct. You can't take what you see off face value. Okay. If he tells you that he love you, you can't believe that he love you. You you, you got to double check, baby. You got to do a background check. You got a uh, credit check. You 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 got to call the law clerk see if he married, baby. You don't take everything what he said face value. You better check that. Same thing for women. You better check that. I love you. Uh, yeah, you and who else? <laughs> Don't take it at face value. My dad taught me that a long time ago. So my daddy, you know, taught me. My husband already know. Come correct. Don't come at all. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be hell when you deal with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's hell, baby. I'll make you pay. Okay. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> he already know. He already know. I'll make you pay, baby. Or oh, I'll make you pay. All right. So let's look at Otitis Media. Okay, I'm going to write this up here. Otitis. Itis mean what? Information. Glad you asked. Okay. So. Otitis. Otitis is a diagnosis code. Otitis media means uh, ear infection. Okay. How many of y'all kids or how many of y'all ever had otitis diagnosed with otitis? Okay. I had an ear infection and a pink eye in the You just kind of missed up. <laughs> <laughs> Bless your heart. You will miss up. Okay, oh, what, what were you going to say, sweetheart? I'm sorry. Oh, no. What did you have? I had a double ear infection. A double ear infection? Double Yo, you were really messed up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <coughs> All right, so otitis oh, media, mean ear infection. Ear infection. Okay, so let's go in the O section. I'm just doing this just so y'all can understand. N O P. Okay, alphabet. N O P. We in the gray section, right? Yeah. Go on the. What is it, baby? Oh, shake it, it quick, quick. You found it, girlfriend. All right, then. Okay. So, old Titus. Did everybody go to old Titus? Okay. All right. So, old Titus Media. Okay, now, 
Look at the words in parentheses. Does everybody see the word in parentheses? Okay. Hemorrhagic. Okay. Uh, staphylococcal. Streptococcal. Okay. When you see words in parentheses next to the term, it means the same thing. Does everybody understand that? If they say otitis media, then you, you use that code. If it says otitis, otitis media or hemorrhagic otitis media or staphylococcal uh, otitis media or uh, streptococcal otitis media, it, it, it all means the same thing. That means you use that code. Does everybody understand that? Who did not understand me? I'm Yes. Yes. But I'm talking about the term itself, media, otitis media. If you find the terms in parentheses next to media, that means also these these terms also means for the so media. They can be listed also. Hmm? They can be listed also. Yes, yes, it means the same thing. It means the same thing. Okay, so what is that code, you guys? H66.9. Does everybody get that? Okay, so we found the code H66.90. What do we need to do with that? No, I'm sorry. Blah, blah, blah. Go back. H66.9. Okay, that was a cute. That was wrong for that. Octitis media. Okay, so the media says 866.9 and has a dash behind it. So that's letting you know that there should be a what? A fourth digit. Does everybody get that? Okay. Do you see it, Chris, where it says media? Okay, we on 360. Okay, so it's, it says H66. Yeah, that's your book, baby. You pay for that. Mm -hmm. You can write. You can write notes. You can highlight it. You can put colors. Oh yeah, that's your. It's all your. But you said when I say media, that's the code for the point Yes, and you see the dash behind it. Yeah. That means it's going to be a what digit? A fourth digit. So anything with a dash behind it means fourth digit. It's going to be a fourth digit. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm sorry. How many digits is that? That's not four. Fifth digit. It's going to be a fifth digit. I'm sorry. Fifth digit. So it, but it's only anything with a dash behind it. That means it's going to be one more digit to add to it. Okay. Yeah, y'all been writing y'all books. Y'all paid for that. Y'all better uh, I doubt that's gonna happen. I'm very serious. I hate to disappoint you. You can try, but I'm gonna already tell you that's gonna be a no. I heard I have a gift of gas. Go for it, bro. Huh? You? I don't know. I don't know. They may not take them, but you sell it on eBay. What is okay. Try eBay. You know? All right, loves. All right, so let's go H66. So now we're going to uh, come out the gray area. I want y'all to pay attention. Come out the gray area. See what it says? Table of neoplasms. Go in that periwinkle color, that, that purple periwinkle. Uh uh. Come out the gray section, Chris. Oh, you are okay. You are that's right. You advance. Sorry. <laughs> no, no harm intended for my new people. Okay. Okay. Come out the gray section and go to that first periwinkle color. That 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 uh purple blue looking color. Come out the gray. Uh uh. You pass it up. Come out the gray. Go go to the last page of the gray. Go to the last page of the gray. Go to the last. Yeah, neoplasms. Go there. Oh, okay. There you go. Go to neoplasm. Everybody go to neoplasm. I'm going there for a reason. Okay, you already there, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is like its own table of, of all the cancer cells, all um, cancer diagnosis. Every cancer diagnosis you could think of is in its own section 
right here in the periwinkle color section. Did everybody get that? That's still considered volume two. Okay, so if you're going to look up cancer diagnosis, if you're going to work for an oncologist or somewhere of that magnitude, uh, immunologist that's dealing with cancer patients, this is where you live in the periwinkle color. Very rare sometimes you might go in the gray area, but periwinkle is going to be where you live. Yes. Periwinkle. That's like a purple, purple blue. Come on, Brenda, help me, girl. What is he trying to do? <laughs> okay, say that again. No, the gray section is your alphabetic list of diagnosis codes in volume two. Your alphabetic list of, of diagnosis codes in volume two. The periwinkle color, color where it says table of contents is also inclusive of volume two. It's just your list of cancer diagnosis. You got that, Chris? So you already in volume one. You verifying. So you, you way ahead of the game. I'm trying to take them through page by page of the book so they can understand their book. Yeah, I'm trying to go through each section. Thank you, Sister Brenda. Because uh, right. Brother Chris just doing his own thing. Uh, yeah, thank you, baby. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, help the brother. Help the brother. Okay, now we're coming out of Periwinkle. We're going to Fuchsia. Fuchsia. That's the next color behind that. Fuchsia. Does everybody get that? Fuchsia. Fuchsia is to say table of drugs and chemicals. Does everybody get that? My left arm hurts. So this is basically like all the drugs and chemicals. Yeah, all the drugs and chemicals, that wine, that that yeah, that poison, that lean, that, that gangster lean. Say hey. What's up? I feel good. What about you? Yeah. Okay. That's that gangster lean stuff. Okay. That's all in the future. Drugs and chemicals. Okay, so coming out the future, we're going into the orange, orange, orange. External cause and injury index. Orange, orange. Okay. Okay, now some of that is like a uh, power craft accident, 18 wheeler accident, animal rider, street car accident, falling off the ladder accident. Huh? Oh, red bite. Yep. Yep. That's in there. Mm hmm. Yep. Uh, tables of drugs and chemicals are for like uh, you did an overdose of vitamin. Well, no, no, no. Let me take that back. Let's say uh, drugs and chemicals. Okay. Um, chemicals like uh, Lysol, inhaling too much Lysol. Okay. Uh, you, you, um, let me, let me find a proper example. Yes, yes. Uh, over sometimes plasma. You can have a plasma, uh, you know, shock. You know, because you've had a blood transfusion or something to that extent, or a plasma transfusion. You know. So uh, look at page five sixty three. This is what I'm talking about, sweet. Yeah. Look at page 563 if, if it's if y'all have the same yearbook that I do. Yeah, look up plasma in a uh, table of drugs and chemicals. Yes. 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 Yes, yes. I'm gonna give you an example of what I mean. Okay, so all this here in table of drugs and chemicals are done alphabetically. I want you to go to the P section and find plasma. 
plasma in in the uh what is this fuchsia color where it says table of drugs and chemicals go to the table 564 okay it's 563 in my book so 564 in your book okay find the word plasma let, it, let me know if you found it brenda you found it chris you found it <laughs> Ooh, next uh daily you found it bless his heart help you brother baby help you brother oh uh, uh what's my sweetie back right here kayla did you find it uh shataria did you find it uh danielle did you find it uh jacaria okay raven okay fantastic now it kind of reads similar to the neoplasm okay so look over here we're going to look to the right and it says t45 x and then it has a placeholder one okay so let's go all the way up this says poisoning accidental unintentional remember i talked about how you could take some tylenol in about 15 20 minutes later you think you want to have that tequila <laughs> or that margarita <laughs> or, or what do you call that long island tea oh, yeah long island iced tea there you go uh you you accidentally but unintentionally poisoned yourself okay that's what that's what that means okay now when it's plasma plasma a person was poisoned accidental that means that maybe the plasma cells didn't match the old type Okay, or they accidentally gave you a plasma cell that was meant for blood type B and, and you're O type with an RH negative or RH positive. Okay, so you your body is going into shock because you have foreign cells and blood that did not match with yours. So it's an accidental match. The, the, the nurse did not read the, the plasma packet before they let it drip through the IV. And so you, the patient, is going through some sort of shock, plasma shock, because you're having a blood plasma transfusion. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? Yeah. So if she doesn't double check that according to the doctor's order that's written in the documentation, and then it has to have your label on there say that this is for you. They may have verified the label say this is for you, but are you sure the ingredients in this packet is for you? So the ingredient in that packet, uh, Blood plasma for uh, uh, blood type B R H positive, and it's going to a person that's O R H negative. They're gonna have a shock. Okay, so that's considered like an accidental poisoning, but unintentional. You were there to be treated, so it wasn't intended to hurt you or harm you. It was just an accident of two plasmas in a blood type that did not match. Does everybody understand that? What's your question, sweetie? Uh, you coded it. You coded the exactly how it right here. Yes. Yes. Now, let's look at the next one. Poisoning intentional self-harm. Now, let's suppose you're a nurse. Let's suppose you're a hospital pharmacist. And you're trained to know how to do IVs. Pharmacists are known how to do IVs because they do chemotherapy. I had a, a, a pharmacist. Uh, at, at Methodist to come talk to me about my uh, chemo treatment, okay, and how it works and stuff like that. And they know how to get it to drip and start, okay, because that's all part of medicine, okay? Now, let's suppose, mm, let's give a good example. Let's suppose this patient is somebody from your pain. Okay, somebody just really just, oh my God. And you are the nurse. And the doctor that's treating you is your friend. And you tell the doctor, that was my ex from the past. And I'm going to exclude, excuse myself from this case because I got sensitive issues with him being my patient on, on my watch, okay, on my rotation, okay. But you and the doctor are good friends, okay. He gonna side with you, 
right? And he going to say, that was her ex. And he did her like this and he did her like that. Okay, I'm going to get him back for her sake. So I'm going to, instead of giving him plasma, because he an old positive, an old, yeah, oh, blood type O, RH positive, I'm going to give him a uh, blood type B, RH negative. I'm going to give him just something totally out. Oh, let's, let's do it like this. I'm going to give him, he is blood type O, RH negative. I'm going to give him plasma. I'm going to be real slick about it. Mm. I'm going to give him a blood type O with RH positive factor in it because he's RH negative. Simple mistake. My new, right? Positive, negative. I can just say I, I overread it. I can just say I overlooked it. Okay. So he goes, he, he goes and do all of that. All of a sudden, the patient goes in a shock. Something happens. They revive the patient. Then the, the patient is complaining. The family is complaining because y'all should have known better. They're going to pull the medical record chart. They're going to say, well, who was on duty when this was occurring? Well, they did have Nurse Judy, but Nurse Judy said she excluded herself because uh, she didn't want to have anything. Well, Nurse Judy, wasn't he on your watch? Why you excluded yourself? Okay, now we, we dig and we ask the questions. Mm -hmm. We're reading body languages. Uh, what you got personal with him? Oh, really? Mm. And hold on. You and Dr. So-and-so, ain't y'all good friends? Didn't you know better not to give him that? You exclude. Did y'all switch up? Because I could have sworn before I left my shift that I gave the correct plasma for him being a blood type O and an RH negative. Why did y'all give him blood type O for RH positive? Oh, I know what it is. Is this something personal with him? Yeah, it was my, he was my past. Oh, so y'all intentionally did this. You, you, you intentionally gave him, you, you, you intentionally did him some harm. Oh, we going down. We going down. Call the hospital lawyer. We going down. Are y'all getting me? Okay. So that right there is poisoning intentional. Okay. Now that's harm, but we have self harm. So let me go, let me go back to my example. So let's suppose, uh, you, uh, you a nurse. You, you know, you know better. You know where all the plasma is. You know the code, how to get in to get that plasma. Because there's code to get certain prescriptions. They have it. You got to put in the code. And every code that's put in is significant to that practicing physician or that nurse. And you decide you want to switch up your plasma for something else because you tired of living and you in debt. And if I go ahead and harm myself, hopefully if I revive <laughs> I could sue the hospital and get some money. It happens, y'all. Y'all got some folk out there that did desperate times, do desperate things. Or I'll die and my family will get life insurance on me. And they could pay off all of that and they don't have to worry about nothing no more. I'll be the sacrificial lamb. Okay. That's self-harm. Do y'all do you see what I'm saying? In a case like that, dealing with blood plasma or anything in that nature. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? The documentation. In the soap notes, with the review of systems, all the documentation has to be said. It has the transcription. It has to read step by step what all the findings were. What was the psychological mindset? Y'all going to learn about that family history, social history. You're going to learn all about that in electronic medical record. You're going to learn about what, what role did all this play with that person, okay, in order for them to self-afflict themselves. Poisoning or salt. Y'all know what poisoning or salt is, right? What you, you go. What you to spend, right? Like well, Miss Harper, she gonna go to the club when she get out of here, right? Ooh, she gonna go to Benji's. Mm. Okay, she going to Benji's. She gonna have a Long Island tea. I'm gonna step to the bathroom. I'll be right, right back. Watch my drink for me. I'll be right back. Somebody, put something in. Somebody gonna do what? 
date rape drug. Date rape drug. <laughs> Because I just got to be having a conversation with him. I just got, got to be having a conversation with her, and I just I hooked him up with a ten dollar tip. I told him, "Watch my drink." He get distracted with somebody else. She she said, "Nigga, watch him." He come out. I come back, girl. This oh, this drink done turned up. What happened? Oh, it done turned up. What's going on in this room? Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, ow. Okay, that's called an assault. Uh, poisoning undetermined. Sometimes poisoning undetermined can happen. You can have uh, a reaction to some ointment cream, you can have a reaction to something over the counter. It's uncertain. You just know your body was just going through something. Remember, every time, every decade you turn an age, your body started letting you know, I don't do those kind of things no more. I'm kicking certain things out. I used to eat spicy food all the time. My body let me know real quick. Can't eat spicy food no more. (laughs) Sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. Under under dosing. Oh, yeah. Adverse effect. Y'all know what that is. Oh, y'all get what I'm saying? Okay, fantastic. So that's what it's for, my dear. Do you understand now? Okay, move right along. Let's come out the, uh, what is this, future? Let's go to the orange. Orange is by accident. I fell off, Johnny fell off the tree. Uh, Daisy Duke was riding on the hood of the General Lee and she fell out. You know, that, yeah. Dukes of Hazard. Done getting y'all watch Dukes of Hazard? Boss out. Okay. That's what got the short days do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. She look good though. Have y'all seen her these days? She look good. I forgot. Huh? No, no, no. The the older one, the, the original Daisy. Oh, did she gain weight? Oh, I didn't know. Oh, well, I don't know. She's always pretty to me, though. But I'm talking about the original Daisy, the original one on the show, Dukes of Hazard. If you have to kind of Google it, watch it on YouTube. That's, that's what I'm talking about. She looks good. She's 64 years old. She looks, I mean, you know, she she on the thick side, but that's natural. When you go older to age, you're going to thicken up. You know, some people do, some people don't. Yeah, that's her name. Yeah, she going to thicken up. Okay, let's move on, you guys. Now, we're getting on to part uh, volume one. Does everybody understand that? This is volume one. What was our diagnosis code that we found for Titus Media? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With a little hash behind it. Very good. A little dash, hash, whatever. See it? Uh-huh. Y'all see it? Okay, I'm being man of black. <laughs> I'm being man of black. Hello. <laughs> okay. Now let's go to the H section. Okay, so purple is what? A. Red is what? C. So we know that purple consists of A through B. Red consists of what? C through G. Orange. Oh, it has a little orange by itself. Why is that? Or is that me? Oh, maybe that's me. Green, D. Periwinkle, E. Fuchsia, L. Orange, G. Purple. H, okay, H what? Six, six. Six, six. It's going to be in the red area? Yeah. Okay, H, six, six. Point nine. H six six point nine. Oh yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, 858 in my book. How about everybody else? Okay, very good, because I know my book is... Okay, okay, give me just a minute. Okay, now, it has a red dot by it. Let's look down here. At the very bottom of your book where it says 858, what does that red dot mean? Okay. Use additional characters. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so now it already has a list of the fifth characters here, so you don't have to do any more search. Everything is already listed. So now, see what it says, Otitis Media Unspecified, Otitis Media Not Otherwise <coughs> Classified, or Acute Otitis Media, Chronic Otitis Media. Okay, so now it has the 866.90 Unspecified ear or uh, the right ear, or the left ear, or the bilateral. Bilateral means both, okay? Now, the doctor has told you that the patient has otitis media. Do you see the word acute? No. Do you see the word chronic? No. Okay, so it is what? What it is, otitis media. So, what we're going to use for a code here is H66.90. Are y'all understanding that? Because it's unspecified. It's not saying, I got you. It's not saying it's acute or chronic. It's unspecified. And that is legitimately okay to use. Are y'all getting me? So, the, uh, if it was acute or chronic, then you would go down to the other. Uh, Oh, if it was acute or chronic, uh, let's see here. Uh, then you could use what well, has to tell which ear too. It has to tell which which ear. Um, but if it if it says it, you can still use unspecified. But it has to. Let me see here. Let me make sure. Hold on. Not security of no can't use that. You can use unspecified, just stick with the nine zero. That is safe to use. Yeah, that is safe to use. Now, if the doctor um says right ear or left ear, then use whatever ear it that is, right or left. Okay, sometimes if, if it does say acute, then you can use the 901. If it says chronic, you can still use the 901. Just make sure it's documented in there. If the medical records folks, I'm sorry, if the insurance company says that I need to uh, request medical records for that particular data service for this particular diagnosis to verify if it was acute or chronic, then make them a copy of that or print up a copy of that electronic medical record for that particular data service only and send it to the insurance company. Okay. What was your question, Chris? I'm sorry. All right. So you said it's going to specify, right? Yes. But if you go back here, the back of the, the index. Okay. It says media. How do you And list those own words. Non-supportive. Superative. Superative. Mm -hmm. Okay. It says look under the non-superative. It says see how tight it's made non-superative. the diagnosis. Okay. So I see a uh, superative over here where it says other chronic superative otitis media. It has like two. Okay. Okay. Let's look up the word superlative. Let's find out what that word means. So Google the word superlative. Google, Google the word superlative in your phone. And you can go to, it should have medicaldictionary.com where you can Google that word. So that's a great question, Chris. I like that. It, 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 it tells you to look there for what the diagnosis was. 
Okay, when you look up acute or chronic? No, it says when you look up the website, it says look up the So that means that I'm actually the blank code actually says page 99. Okay, let me see what you're talking about. With effusion, none, uh, perulent, C, otitis media, and then it has none superlative. So it has to be otitis media with effusion. Yeah, so the diagnosis code has to say the uh, otitis media with effusion, and it can be also included, inclusive of that. But since it doesn't say otitis media with effusion, then that's not the diagnosis you want to be on. Yeah. The, the, the diagnosis on the board is simply otitis media. Mm -hmm. But the, that's a very good question. Glad you asked it. Very good question. Okay. Did y'all find what superlative means? Chris, uh, since you on that, find out what the word perulent. Mm hmm. Superlative means um, underlying formation of pus. Pus? pus. Yeah, uh huh. Okay. <laughs> Undergoing formation or fester. Okay. So a person can have an ear infection and they got an ear infection on the inner, inner ear and there's like an abscess in there. Okay. And sometimes people can develop an abscess and they need a lancet. Okay. Or there's an infection. You know how when you have infections of the body, and you know when your body, you know when your body is sick or your or your body's going through some sort of infection, it's going to start into a boil. Have y'all ever gotten boils before? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's because somewhere in your body you're you're not feeling well, so it's it's going to give off somewhere in your body where that infection wants to spew out. It's going to come to a head somewhere. Okay. You have, uh, especially African Americans, uh, we're known to have uh, boils more than anything because our hair tends to curl up and grow out. So instead like of it, like ingrown hair, exactly, it'll, it'll curl up underneath there. If it doesn't come out correctly through the follicles, it'll create a boil. Okay. And so anytime your body has an infection, it's going to give off at some point. Like you have canker sores, you know, uh, your, your immune system is going low. You're nervous about something. When you're nervous and your immune system is going low. I know with me in college, when I was at Prairie View a lot and I would study for exams and stuff like that, I would get canker sores on the inner lining of my mouth because I was stressing so hard about taking tests. and. I had an anatomy physiology teacher, Dr. Henderson. That man was just a horror. You know, he was good though. I ain't gonna lie, he was a, a fantastic. <laughs> he was a fantastic uh, teacher. But baby, your pops squeeze on you in a minute. Hello. Hello. Yes. Oh, okay, baby, but the, the front desk people had. I don't know if the front desk people are still there. I don't, I don't know. Is she is she coming to the school? Oh, bless her heart. Okay. Um oh bless. Okay, well, uh, Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay. Um, uh, you know why our desk is up here? Well, to your left, and it's the second desk. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, honey, it's, it's almost 8 o'clock. I don't know if anybody still got the phone or not. No, sweetie, I'm still here. Uh, okay, you know what? Let me ask Mr. Jackson because he may know where they put it up, but I, I have a student go with Mr. Jackson. Okay, sweetie. Okay, okay, sweetie. Okay, okay. okay. I will. Yeah. Okay, you know what? I'm sorry, y'all. We are past lunch break. Do y'all want to go to lunch? Okay, because I got to go and uh, find this check. Oh, Lord, we've been two hours and 25 minutes. Rolling, rolling, rolling on the river.